If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 22. An amazing scripture here. Acts 22. Turn with me. Today I'd like to speak to you on the subject of Paul's testimony. Paul's testimony. Listen to me, folks. Everybody, if you are a Christian, you have a testimony. If you are a Christian, a testimony, you testify of something that you personally witnessed. And you have personally witnessed your own salvation, okay? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. So you have a testimony. And here's what the deal is. Usually it has to have a test. A test to have a testimony. All right? And, and our faith needs to remain strong. I want to show you three things in Scripture today. Three things. Number one, Paul's early conduct. Paul's early conduct. Listen, folks, Saul was not a good man. All right, you're going to see he was a bad man. He was a bad dude. People were afraid of him. All right, his early conduct. Two, Paul's wonderful conversion. Conversion means change. Change. God changed his life. God changed his thoughts. God changed his heart. And number three, Paul's special calling. Folks, we all have something in life that God wants us to do. We have something in life. And part of that is sharing your testimony. And I will uh, uh, refer to that in the third point. You know, the headquarters of the Roman soldiers were located overlooking the temple grounds. From the guard towers, sentries had clear view of the temple area where civil unrest in Jerusalem was most likely to break out. It, is, uh, it obviously didn't take long to see that trouble was brewing and a riot was taking place. The report said that all of Jerusalem was in a state of confusion and the mob was seeking to kill Paul. And again, it might be overstated all of Jerusalem. All it's saying is there were hundreds of people there. Hundreds. Uh, uh, like the demonstrations uh, that we are seeing now. Up to this point, Paul had remained silent. Paul decided it was time for him to speak up. Paul's defense began by telling the crowd that he was not anti-Jewish. And folks, there's going to be accusations on Christians. There's going to be you know, accusations. We hate certain types of people. We hate. And folks, I'm telling you, we love people. We hate sin. We hate sin. We should hate sin, but we should not hate people. It was a strange place for Paul to preach, standing on the steps, surrounded by Roman soldiers, chained to Roman soldiers while people were calling for his life. But as Paul began to speak, a hush fell over the scene. He was about to give his personal testimony before hundreds of lost people. Let's look at this amazing text. Number one, Paul's early conduct. Brethren, notice how, Acts 22 verse 1, brethren and fathers, and, and folks, he is addressing them respectfully. Okay, these guys just beat him, beat him left him bloody, and he still respects them. Brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. And when they heard that, he spoke to them in Hebrew language. They all kept the more silent. They were surprised. They were surprised that he could speak Hebrew. Folks, that was the Jewish language. He was accused of being an Egyptian renegade. And, and the commander there understood, and Paul explained to him that he was not uh, that. So even for them to get quiet, God had to intervene. Then he said, I am indeed a Jew, born of Tarsus, of Sicilia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the, strict, the strictness of our father's law, and was zealous towards God as you are all today. See, he didn't just start lambasting them. He didn't just start telling them off. He didn't start whining and saying how unfair this was. He was presenting facts of the case. And the first facts that he mentions is, hey, I was born a Jew. I understand it's a Hellenistic Jew, but he was still a Jew. He was trained by one of the best teachers in that region. His father uh, uh, was the one that even in writing the Jewish, you know, from the Jewish laws and all these things, he was the one that did that. So Paul, who was Saul then, was trained by some of the finest 
Jewish teachers around. Hold your finger there and go with me to Philippians chapter 3. I want to give you some more of his resume. Philippians 3. Philippians 3 verse 3. For we are circumcision. And we know if you were circumcised, you were Jewish. On the eighth day, the males were circumcised. It is part of the Jewish sect who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ, and have no confidence in the flesh. What's the difference between him and them? He was a saved Jew. All right, he knew Christ. He knew Christ. And, and, and again, he's going to do his testimony here in just a minute. Though I may also have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks that he had, may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. What's he saying? I could brag about my Jewish heritage. I could quote more law than you can. I can be more spiritual than you can. He, but he says, I'm not bragging about that. I just want you to know who I am. Circumcised the eighth day. The stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. He was a rabbi, folks. A rabbi. And it says, concerning the law and of Pharisees, the group that he was addressing, he used to be one of them. And the reason it seems confusing is you have to realize Paul, who was Saul, had been gone somewhere 22 years or more. He had been gone from Jerusalem. He had went on three missionary journeys. So he probably was speaking to many of the, not the fathers and the ones he served with, but to a lot of the sons. But even, I promise you, those sons had heard of Saul and knew who he was but they were scratching their head on the Paul part. And that's what Paul was doing. He was saying, I used to do these things, but I have changed. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. What was his job? Folks, the Sanhedrin was the one that gave him the authority to go around uh, and start arresting Christians. So that was his conduct in the past. And folks, I'm telling you, Satan wants to remind us who we were. And you know what you need to do? Remind Satan who you are. When somebody, you know, and it doesn't happen here in town, but when I go back to Lawton and I'll run into somebody in a restaurant and they'll say, hey, Taco, what's going on? Taco was my high school name on the baseball team. And what it tells me is I either played baseball with that person or they were uh, connected with Eisenhower High Sports. But folks, I got news for you. In 1982, Taco died. All right, I am no longer. Matter of fact, if you call me that, I'm not offended by it, but you will offend somebody, okay? It's my heritage. You know, you call me, call me whatever you want. My point is, I no longer live there. I no longer live in Lawton. Folks, this is my home. This is the church I serve in. All that other is in the past. And Paul was trying to say, before I got saved, I was just like you. Okay? Back in our text. Look back in our text. And he says, and I persecuted the way, verse 4, I persecuted this way to death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest bears me witness. Folks, he had the papers and the authority from the high priest. From the high priest. And all the council of the elders, that was the Sanhedrin, for whom I received letters to the brethren and went to Damascus to bring uh, in chains even those who were there to Jerusalem to be punished. Why were they leaving Jerusalem? Because they knew of Paul. Why were they leaving Jerusalem? Or it was actually Saul back then. Saul. Because if you were part of the way, and they think, and, and, and they, they're fairly sure it's based on Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And it was another word for Christianity. So he tells them, my early conduct wasn't good. It wasn't good. I beat people up. I, I even later on he talks about uh, being there when Stephen was stoned, and he said, 
uh, this is what I used to do. I was one of you. And the second thing I want you to see, not only Paul's early conduct, but Paul's wonderful conversion. He goes into detail on how God changed his life. Now it happened as I journeyed, verse 6, and came to Damascus about noon. Suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me. And that's real interesting because it was daylight. So when it says a bright light, to know that another light was there, it had to be a blinding light. Blinding. And I fell to the ground and I heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul. Notice his word. And you have to realize his name was, his Hebrew name was Saul. So he's, he again gives those hints. He keeps throwing those in. I used to be one of you. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Or, or why are you persecuting me? And he said, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now here's the deal about the, your testimony, folks. You were present when you were saved. You were the eyewitness of you being saved. So people, and here's what's amazing, cannot repute or disagree with your personal testimony. They wasn't there. They don't know. They don't know what you were before then. Some people do, but Paul was simply saying, I didn't even know who this guy was. I wasn't even looking for Jesus. I wasn't even sure who he was. But he spoke to me, even though the men could not hear what was going on, and, and he fell to the ground. Jesus himself spoke to Saul. Verse 9, And those who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid, but they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. So I said, What shall I do? And the Lord said, Arise and go to D Damascus, and there you'll be told all things which you are appointed to do. He was going, think about this, to Damascus, Originally, to get prisoners, to persecute Christians. Now, guess who is the prisoner of God? It is Saul. Oh, listen to me, folks. I am telling you, my conversion experience, I went down the aisle when I was five. I'm just telling you, I didn't know what I was doing. Don't remember any counseling. All I knew is you got your picture when you get baptized. One of those Polaroid cameras, I thought those were the coolest thing. Just come out of the front. And I thought, man, I want to do that. Did no squat at five years old. Fourteen years old, I went to Falls Creek Friday night. Everybody's crying. We were doing the whole thing. But when I went back to school that fall, I was the same person that I was before I went to Falls Creek. The Bible says in Matthew 7, there are false professions of faith. But when I was 22 years old, folks, I am telling you, I had a Saul to Paul conversion. God totally changed my life. Now, I am not perfect. I am not all that I need to be. And I strive. I love God. I want to serve God. I want to, uh, you know, give my testimony. And my testimony is, it is worth it all. I would give up everything, everything for, for knowing Christ, just for knowing Christ. Verse 11, and since I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand to those who were with me, I came to Damascus. And then a certain Ananias, a devout man according to the law. Notice he even talked. We, we're going to turn over there in just a second. But he tells who Ananias was. He was of Jewish descent also. Notice he just through this whole speech keeps dropping things, just, just letting them know these little points that really make a difference because it, it, it intrigued their interest, okay? If you can hold an audience quiet, that big, who had rioted before, they are listening to every word that you say. And it says, with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me, and he stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that same hour, I looked up at him. Then he said, the God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one and hear, uh, and just one and hear the voice of his mouth. 
So Ananias was the one appointed to, to go to Saul and to lead him to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Folks, that's not easy to do because I want to show you, turn with me to Acts chapter 9. You folks that are afraid to share your testimony or gospel, you are not, I'm just telling you, you are not in the boat alone. Ananias, listen and look at this, all right? Because here's the deal about sharing your testimony and sharing the gospel. The main thing that keeps you from doing that is fear. It's fear. We are afraid we might say the wrong thing. We are afraid we might mess it up. We are afraid that we might offend. We are afraid. And folks, I'm telling you, God does not give us the spirit of fear. All right, it's false evidence appearing real. That's what fear is. And Satan's greatest tool is fear. In, there was fear even in Ananias. All right, a just, a devout man, he feared. Look at Acts chapter 9, verse 10. Now, there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, okay, you may call it a dream, you just may call it the Holy Spirit. He could have just been in prayer, but he heard the voice of the Lord. That is Jesus. That is red letters in your Bible. And he said, here am I, Lord. Boy, that's a good answer there. When God speaks to us, that is a good answer. Here I am, Lord. No, no, Lord, we'll talk later on. I'm a little busy right now. That's not a good thing to say. Okay, not a good thing to say. When God talks to you, quiet down and listen. Listen. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas uh, for the one called Saul of Tarsus. Not the Judas we know, by the way. For behold, he is praying, and in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hands on him so that he might receive his life. Do you notice between the time he was blinded, the time he went uh, to, uh, to Damascus, what was he doing? He was praying. Why was he praying? Because he is blind. He had never been blind. He had always been in control. He had the power. He had the power. He, he was strong. But yet, folks, God took away his sight so that he could save him. Save him. Verse 13, and Ananias answered and said, Lord, I've heard many, uh, I, I've heard from many about this man, about how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. Ananias starts getting cold feet, starts saying, Woo, uh, God, are you sure about that? Did you, rock, did you knock on the right door? <laughs> you at the right address. All right. I mean, he starts backpedaling, thinking, Man, I heard of this dude. This dude kills people. All right. I don't want anything to do with this guy. All right, And here he has the authority from the chief priest to bind all who call upon your name. He can do it legally. He can do it legally. But the Lord said unto him, go. Go, folks. Folks, the Lord is still, I'm going to share with you a scripture that tells you at the end to go. All right, We can't just sit and wait for people to come to our church. Although that happens and you invite people and we are growing, I understand. But the Bible tells us to go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. And I believe this is where Ananias changed his outlook. He realized that God had his hand on this whole situation. Though at first he just thought, oh man, are you kidding me? I don't want to even talk to Saul, much less share the gospel with him. All right, verse 16, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house and laying hands on him, he probably prayed for him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent, um, sent me uh, that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. How would Ananias know first who Saul was, and how would he know, uh, you know that he was set apart? I mean, what I'm saying is Ananias had no idea who Saul was personally, and he had no idea what Paul was doing. Okay, he, he, he didn't know he was coming, 
But God told him exactly what he needed to do, where he needed to go, and who he needed to talk to. And it was confirmed by the Holy Spirit. So when Ananias got there, he was, he was confident. He realized this stuff just can't happen. Folks, there are things called divine appointments where God puts you in certain situations to help people, to show people the way, to share your testimony, to invite people to church. And there was fear at first. And folks, uh, you know, fear is real, but I'm saying we can overcome those fears through Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse 18, immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. Boy, I'm telling you, Ananias was thinking, man, man, I'm glad he listened. I'm glad the Holy Spirit, I'm glad God was there. It could have turned out a lot worse. But folks, God had a divine appointment for Ananias. And when he said, here I am, Lord, it started that divine appointment into motion. Folks, I'm telling you, there is a lost world out there that needs Jesus Christ the Lord. The times which we are living now, it's people that have no hope. It's people that are sad. It's people that are lost. It's people that are hurting. It's people that are wandering. It's people that are confused. It's people that just don't know the way. And many times, you know, we go and we go and, and we just bypass. We don't take the time to share our testimony or the gospel with people. Folks, I don't know anything more important, more important than sharing the love of Christ with someone. And that's what Ananias did. Let's look at the rest of our text there. Verse 15. For you will be his witness to all men, talking about Paul, of what you have seen and heard. And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And sometimes this phrase, washing away your sins, uh, you know, some people associate that uh, with salvation and baptism. But if you realize the first thing Saul did in Ananias was he got saved. Okay? Saved first. The Holy Spirit came into him first. And the phrase uh, Luke uses of washing away simply means accepting the cleansing. All right? Because, folks, I had, man, when I was 22, I had a lot of baggage. A lot of baggage. One of the fears I had when I surrendered to the ministry was people that knew me the way I was happened to come to a church service and they look up there and say, Taco, Whoa, what are you doing there? Why are you here? Why are you speaking? Because they had not heard. They had not known. And for the first four or five years of my life, living in Lawton where I lived all my life, I was the one in fear thinking, man, I hope I don't run into some of these folks. And folks, here's the deal. The devil will do anything to keep you from sharing your testimony. He'll do anything. Anything. And folks, he doesn't play fair. Okay? He will hit you. He will punch you. He will sucker punch you. All right? But you have to overcome these things. So we see Paul's early conduct. We see Paul's wonderful conversion. What a conversion experience, folks. I mean, it was life-changing. It was amazing. Here, here, he, here he came. And then he explains the last part, Paul's special calling. Verse 17, Now it happened when, he, when I returned to Jerusalem, I was praying in the temple and was in a trance. Notice what he's doing this time. All right, first he was praying, man, I just hope I, I don't have to be blind. I hope I don't stay this way. God saved him. And what does he do? He goes to the temple. Notice how, I'm just telling you, Paul knew what he was doing. He kept weaving these things. Because you remember what he was accused of. He was accused of not liking Jews. He's accused of desecrating the temple. 
All right? He was accused of these things, and, and he was just showing them. Proof. Matter of fact, Paul could have easily been a lawyer, a Christian lawyer also, okay? All right? And I'm not saying lawyers are not. Lawyers are Christian. You just got, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on. I'm going to get in trouble here. <laughs> Paul Post, no offense. Okay, bro? Okay, he's waving okay at me. All right. <laughs> Woo! That I was in a trance. And I saw him saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. God said, your ministry is not in Jerusalem. It's not in Jerusalem. It's not in Jerusalem. Folks, that was his calling. And just like he said when Ananias told him, you are going to preach to Gentiles and kings and men of authority. And ha do you notice how that came full circle around Saul's life to Paul, and that was exactly what he would be doing the rest of his life. The rest of his life. Verse 19, so I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I imprison and beat those who believe you. And folks, again, I can relate to this. All right, Paul Saul, who Saul, who was Paul, was just saying, man, are you sure? You know, is anybody going to listen to me? Is anybody going to believe me? Is anybody going to put their faith and trust, you know, because of who I am? And folks, Satan loves to bring up your past. When he does, tell him, listen, my past is my past. Listen, I can't change what I did yesterday. Yesterday is gone. Today's a new day. Today's a new opportunity. Today's a day you can go. Verse 20, And when the, blood, when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by consenting to his death. And you know what Paul was doing? He was, he was giving him a jab there, the guys. He was saying, if you remember, I was standing there when you guys stoned Stephen. So now it's getting serious. Paul is getting down to the nitty gritty. He is showing them that they are sinners and they need Jesus Christ. And it says, and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then he said to me, depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. Folks, the three missionary journeys that we have studied all the way through the book of Acts, there has been no man, especially in the day in which he lived, you either walked, you rode an animal, or you were on a ship. And to think of what God did through Paul is amazing. It is amazing. One of the greatest missionaries, one of the greatest soul winners, one of the greatest church planters, one of the greatest disciples that ever was on the face of the earth was the Apostle Paul. And I am telling you, hush was over that place and over these people until he said that last line. When he said, depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles, everything changed everything changed and again that's where we're stopping today but i'm just telling you folks you will see their true colors in a couple of weeks so what what was the assignment what was the calling for paul acts one go to acts one with me please acts one just a few more scriptures acts one eight this is jesus talking to his disciples but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. That's salvation, okay? You will have Holy Spirit power. You're not alone. You're not alone. God is with you. He'll give you the words to say. Jesus even told them when he sent the disciples out two by two, and you shall be witnesses to me. Shall means you need to do this, all right? What good is a silent witness? What good in a court of law? Is a silent witness. Yeah, I saw it, but nah, I'm not saying nothing about it. 
And what's crazy, folks, we have the greatest gift to give somebody. And sometimes we just, we just shut down. That fear just overcomes us. You shall be witnesses for me in Jerusalem. That's in your city. Jerusalem, in Judea, in your state, in Samaria, in the United States, and to the end of the earth. That is your assignment. And I am telling you, if you think about it historically, Paul went to the ends of the earth for the day in which he lived. He went to where there was no gospel and no churches. None of them. Matthew 28. Go with me. Matthew 28. What was the assignment? Look at verse 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them. So Jesus spoke to them before. Jesus spoke to them again. All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. See, the authority that the Sanhedrin had given Saul, God has given us authority. Our instructions are from God himself. Go, there's that word, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. That's discipleship. And, behold, and lo, I am with you always. You are never alone, folks. Never. There's never a time in your Christian life that you are alone. Even in the pandemic, I know it was so isolating. It was just, it was just so lonely at times. And folks, I'm telling you, Satan is behind that. You're never alone, never alone. Even to the end of the age, forever and ever. You will never be alone. Now turn my last scripture, Matthew chapter 5. Go to Matthew 5. Because I got to thinking about this. These people, the Sanhedrin and, you know, the crowd, the Jewish folks from Ephesus who hated Paul, almost beat him to death. And he was chained on the foot, on the steps, chained to two Roman soldiers. He was bloody and blood was running down his face. And what was he doing? He was sharing the gospel with these people. So it got me to thinking. Matthew 5, verse 43. And this is Jesus' word. You have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Okay? Are we supposed to hate people? I don't think so, folks. See, the world says you can hate. Okay? You can hate. This is Jesus' word, for, words. But I say to you, love your enemies. Folks, these were, I'm telling you, they were Paul's enemies. They hated him. And what did he do? He just loved them. He loved them so much that he shared his personal testimony with them. Bless those who curse you. <laughs> do you bless people that curse you? Or do you curse people that curse you? Folks, when you do that, you're just like them. They are, you, you're coming down to their level. All right? I coached. I was a coach, and I, I was cussed out as a coach. I mean, I mean, I, my coaches, when I was growing up, I had coaches that just swore all the time. Folks, it's the language of the ignorant, folks. We are Christians. We are Christians. And look at this. Do good to those who hate you. Do good. Do you do good? And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Folks, Paul lived it. Paul was just not saying it. Paul had been beaten to a pulp, and if the Roman soldiers had not gotten there, he would have been dead. But you know what? God wasn't through with Paul yet because he was going to stand before emperors. He was going to go to the White House in our world and tell them about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Folks, we have the greatest news, the absolute greatest news ever written. You know, we have newspapers. And I'm telling you, you can't believe half of what's in a newspaper. Not even half. Oh, I read that on the internet. Oh, really? <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> Good for you. But folks, 
We've got the Word of God. We've got the truth of God. We've got the love of God. We've got the best news ever shared to mankind. And God says, go. Go. Father, thank You for the day. God, I thank You for Your Word. Your Word is just, yes, truth and amen. And God, I, I really don't understand people that say the Bible is boring. God, the Bible is rich. It is full of truth. It is life examples. And God, I pray that we could be more like Jesus. Be more like Jesus. Lord, He was here, and for three and a half years, His ministry pointed us to the way. To the way. And God, I pray that we would not be afraid to use our testimony when we speak to folk. We would not be afraid to use the gospel, uh, the saving gospel of Jesus Christ to folk. We wouldn't be ashamed uh, to invite them to church and come sit with me. I'll pray for you. I'll help you any way I can. God, I pray that we would just become bold in our witness and bold with our testimonies. And God, I pray we won't hate. God, I pray that we will pray for people that are ugly to us. And we will love them because you love them. God, this is your invitation. God, if there's one soul here that needs Jesus Christ, I pray they'd come forward. It's the greatest decision I ever made in my life. I pray that they would be free from the chains, the chains and the bondage of sin this day. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to us during this time of invitation. Maybe a Christian needs to rededicate their life. Maybe somebody needs to come for baptism or join the church. Lord, whatever you want them to do, God, I pray they would be like Saul and obey. They would be like Ananias and obey you. And we'll be careful to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?